of what a, a person of that of a religious order would look like, and yet they go back thousands of years before that. You can go back in uh, stone carvings in Ireland and England among the Celts, and they always had these monk-like figures which were emissaries of the unknown, of the dead, and they always traveled in threes, Eddie, and we had a double group of them here in St. Rita's. Six. Three in white and three in black. Three good guys and three bad guys, if you at, will. At St. Rita's. At St. Rita's. Anybody listening who could shed a little light on this story and tell us even more than we know already, we would welcome that call, wouldn't we? We certainly would. We've had calls on the program from people who were actually in the church that day, too, haven't we? Several. Yes, we have. They're, no. st they're still around the area. Very often, though, uh, as in many cases of this magnitude, Eddie, people are reluctant to talk about it. So in case anyone out there would like to contact me and doesn't want to go on the air, please just drop me a line or get in touch with me. Uh, and we'll announce the address again uh, in just a moment. We're going to take a news break here and come back. But that story of St. Rita's Church, I think, is one of the, the most unusual and uh, scary that you ever told. I think we can be lucky it didn't happen to us, Ed. You better believe it. It's 1 o'clock in the morning. Richard Crow, Ghost Hunter, is with me. Ten minutes past 1 o'clock in the morning. Relax and enjoy the program if you're working. Don't lose uh, sight of your little project there if you're driving. Stay awake, please. Stay safe if you're at home. Good. If you're supposed to be studying for summer school and you are not, shame on you. If you didn't make the day camp lunches for tomorrow yet, don't forget to include the ghost toasties. They're always good on a nice Friday at day camp. If you'd like to write to Richard about his ghost tour or send him some information, his address is P.O. Box 29054. That's 29054, and that's Chicago 60629. You ready to go back to work here, my ghost hunter? For sure, Ed. All righty. We'll answer the telephone at 591-5656. That's my number. Hello, Bob. Good. How you doing this morning? All right. Very good. Thank you for your patience. What would, what would you like to tell us this morning? Well, I haven't been on Richard's tour since, I think, 78. And I had a couple of questions to ask him. Okay. One is, uh, in 77, when we were on your tour through the company I work with, one of the girls took some pictures of the bars at Resurrection Cemetery. Uh-huh. And I was going to check tomorrow to see if any of them came out. Because we took them that night uh, that it was drizzling, showing the indentations on the bars. Mm -hmm. Do you have good pictures of those, Rich? Do you have a lot of pictures? Yes, I have color slides, Ed, and black and white uh, glossies. In fact, uh, uh, I've made copies for a number of people who have, of course, heard about it in the years since they uh, were taken out or blowtorch. So those are... Uh, very interesting pictures. If you have good copies, I would like to uh, uh, have you send me some extra prints, and I'll pay you for it, because I always am looking for good copies of those myself. Okay. Uh, question I had, one of them anyway, was uh, what's been happening on German Church Road lately? Anything? The site of the Grahams girls? German Church Road apparently has been uh, fairly quiet uh, uh, recently, and uh, one of the individuals who was a contact out there uh, a friend of mine who had some contacts out there, there was a, a death, so I don't have uh, uh, real input with certain uh, uh, people out there anymore. But uh, if anybody out that way has any information on anything going on, we'd like to hear about it. German Church Road, of course, Ed, is the place where the Grimes girls' bodies were discovered in January of 1957, that very famous unsolved child murder of uh, the mid-50s. And uh, the two girls' bodies were found uh, just... Uh, north of the uh, road, on the north side of the road, German Church Road, just east of County Line Road. And uh, what happens there is primarily a ghostly sounds of a car pulling up to the road, opening its doors, apparently throwing something out, the doors slamming, and the, the car peeling away, and nothing visible. And on the one occasion that uh, uh, I know of from uh, Cook County Police reports, involves a woman who did see, who did report seeing a car, hazy limousine looking car pull up to the road and dump two bodies over the side of the rail and then disappear so we have what apparently is the uh, a psychic reenactment of the dumping of the bodies on german church road so anybody out that way who might have some more information to uh, give us on that we certainly would like to hear that and on your original tour that you did for my company you were talking about a uh, church downtown or the downtown area about where the priest was called upon by two boys dressed in, as altar boys who uh, led them to their mother's house who was deathly ill. Right, that's the famous Father Damon story. Father Damon, who one day may become the first uh, 
uh, well, outside of Mother Cabrini, who's a Chicago saint, but she wasn't always in Chicago, but of, of a Chicago resident, I would say Father Damon may well become the first Chicago saint because of his mystical experiences, but the most famous of which uh, is the one you just mentioned, the fact that in the 1880s he was visited by two boys who came to him very mysteriously one night during a rainstorm, uh, dressed as altar boys. They led him to a cottage at the edge of the parish, Holy Family Church at Roosevelt Road in May. They led him to this cottage, and there he found an old woman who he uh, gave the last rites of the church to, who lived long enough to talk to him about this and burst into tears when he described these boys because she said, those are my sons who were been dead now for many years. And sure enough, in 1863, in a boating accident, uh, two boys at an altar boy picnic were drowned from that parish. And to commemorate that event in the church to this day, on either side of the main altar, is a statue of an altar boy, one on the left hand and one on the right hand side, the two phantom brothers that are standing there mutely as statues to this day to commemorate that event from... Uh, 90 years ago. And, uh, I, the first two you did for the company I worked for, I missed, but uh, the stories that everybody is still talking about is, uh, are fantastic. And I have a, for my college course, I did a paper on exorcism and possession. And one of the stories that I was reading, I think it may be your same Father Nicola, did a exorcism of a house in California and got condoned by the church for doing it as a publicity stunt. You mean condoned or condemned? Condemned. Okay. Thank you. It's early. Yes. And uh, sitting at the house, it wasn't actually spirits. It was more, uh, oh, the the friendly little ghost. Like, the just poltergeist. The poltergeist. Uh -huh. Thank you. And they condoned him for doing the exercise. No, they condemned him. Condemned him. It's early. It's early. <laughs> but, oh, listen. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, I completely forgot that Rich was on tonight. Mm hmm And, uh... Every time our company held a tour, we signed up for it. And I wish he'd come back, but we have to arrange it again. Is this from uh, Banker's Life and uh, Casualty? You know it. Okay. No, they're, they're some of my gr uh, greatest fans are from Banker's Life and Casualty Company. You know it. And, uh, and tell Sue Sawicki to give me a call. I will tell Well, I'm leaving tomorrow to go to a member, member company. So I will tell Sue before I leave to give you a call. Okay. But, uh... Hopefully we, they can arrange another tour for you, because I was on your two Halloween tours. Uh-huh. And they're still fantastic. Well, you're a real a real good bunch of people out at Banker's Life and Casualty. Eddie, we have, uh, uh, I have done tours, of course, for all kinds of groups and all kinds of people, but there are some that keep coming back, and I see the same people come back. And really, every tour is different, because you get into different tangents on the material. So I'd be glad to do another one for you. Also in trouble with certain police departments. <laughs> Ooh, what's that all about? I better not ask. We'll leave, we'll leave it at that. Yes. Thank you very much for your call. Take care. Take Thanks, care. Bud. Bye-bye. It's one W-I-N-D. Hello there. Hello, Eddie. Uh, hello, who's this? This is Mike. Hi, Mike. How you doing? Well, I just got another story handed me, Mike, before you go ahead with your point. A strike by 1,700 Ozark Airlines. You're allowed to say okay, Mike. Okay. All right. I mean, I just don't <laughs> want to make like I'm talking to myself, but if there are any employees of Ozark listening, the strike is over, and we'll we're very glad happy. of that. Mike, hold on one second, okay? Sure. We've got another gentleman sitting in the studio with us who's been here since the very beginning, and uh, he is uh, part of the world of the unusual, part of the world of the, uh, well, I guess, would psychic be fair, Rich? How would you introduce this man if you were before a public group and he was to speak right after you? How would you introduce him before we I'd say... I'd introduce him by name because he's very well known. What else would you say? Uh, uh, the man who's going to be on here in a second... Uh, uh, is known uh, primarily as a thought photographer, I would say. And uh, he has shown remarkable ability with uh, Polaroid cameras that have been able to photograph images by his mind power alone. Mind power alone, that means, of course, Ted Sirius must be here. And Ted Sirius is sitting right, right across the table from me next to Richard. Hi, Ted. How are you, Ed? We've talked before. It's nice to have you with us. You've been sitting here very patiently. We've all been so engrossed in these phone calls, I almost forgot Ted was sitting here. <laughs> He's not invisible, Ed. No, not, <laughs> not at all. Uh, what is your involvement in the unusual? Uh, the fact that you're here, we might as well ask. So tell me, please, what? how long ago, how far does it go back, and what do you do, really? I mean... If you had to explain it. Hmm. Well, it's been over 20 years that uh, uh, that I've been doing this. Uh, I, I have no explanation for it. I've worked uh, 20 years with scientists to try to find out what I'm doing, and I don't know what I'm doing. I still don't know. But describe to me what happens when you do what you don't know what you're doing. Well, 
Could you give me a, a Polaroid camera? And uh, I try to get uh, something that you want me to photograph. And uh, that's exactly what it is. But you know, wh where do you go with a camera? What do you do with it? I, I, just, I just look into the lens. You, in other words, you're photographing your mind? I don't know. I don't know. You're kidding. I'm not this kidding. Is, this is what Ted Sirius does, Rich, <laughs> huh? Yes, and uh, Dr. Jewel Eisenbud, for one, has spent quite a bit of time with Ted, uh, doing experiments with Ted, and published a book called The World of Ted Sirios, which was just full of photographs of different things that Ted was able to photograph by concentrating at it and snapping the shutter of the camera while facing himself. I find all of this is very interesting. It is too bad that we do not have a... If we had a camera here right now, a Polaroid camera, and we asked you to look into the lens and see something, would it happen? I mean, does it, does it always happen? No, absolutely not. I don't know. Uh, uh, unless it's a target anyway, I'd, uh, I wouldn't even uh, count it as anything because... Um, um, How do you mean a target? What do you mean? Well, I mean, uh, say something... Uh, uh, that you want me to photograph like uh, the water tower or something on Michigan Avenue, mm -hmm. and I don't know that you want me to photograph that. If I photograph that, mm -hmm. then uh, I would say, you know, I would claim it. But if I missed, if I got something else, then it's no good as far as I'm concerned. Well, no, but you see, if I handed you a Polaroid camera and you looked down the lens and anything at all came out on that film, I would be thoroughly convinced and totally impressed. I wouldn't care what it was. <laughs> no, I no, it, 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 uh, well, why, <laughs> why is that? I mean, Richard, doesn't that make sense that if he takes a Polaroid camera and looks at it and out comes a picture that uh, that's impressive enough? It would be impressive, Ed, but of course, uh, in a strictly scientific view, uh, what Ted should be able to produce is uh, something that has just been decided upon without Ted's that's uh, right. uh, influence at all, mm -hmm. so that the... Uh, scientist or researcher watcher who was uh, working with Ted uh, would not say just photograph anything because Ted well uh, let's say uh, if if indeed it, it is possible to fake and uh, oh and how sure uh, how could you fake that if you were sitting right here in this room with a Polaroid camera just the three of us and it was a fresh roll of film there was no possible way that anybody could have tampered with well, it well there's a lot of magicians say they, that they can do it plenty of them or he For one, has done it. Right. Well, well, if you would have a, uh, if you would say just photograph anything, okay, this would eliminate the possibility, the the chance of fraud, in the case where suddenly the decision to shoot, let's say the water tower is made by you, then the mm -hmm. the, the the chance that Ted would have some implement on his body that would have the right. water tower image, right, would right. be astronomically uh, uh, nil. So uh, therefore, it would l lend all the more credibility to the experiment. How many pictures would you have to take before you were capable of reproducing something? I mean, if, I, if we were sitting here right now and I said, Ted, here's the Polaroid, take a picture of the Marriott Hotel across the street, how many times would he have to click that shutter, do you think, before something would come up, if anything? Oh, if anything? Mm -hmm. If anything at all? Yeah. I'd, oh, I'd say uh, three or four pictures, something would come up. I don't know whether it would be your target or not, but I guarantee you something would come up. Really? Oh, yeah. Where can we get a Polaroid camera at 1.25 in the morning? <laughs> Boy, if I had a Polaroid camera here right now, would you do it? I take a, I always take a crack at it. You would? Yeah, and I know I know Willie Schwanholz right now is blown his top right now because I just told him tonight, I said, I'll never pick a camera up again. Oh, why, why is that? <laughs> I don't know. I just uh, tired of the whole thing. You know. Bring Ted out of retirement here uh, <laughs> sometime in the near future. You're yeah. tired of the whole thing, but this is giving you fame. I mean, you've been on radio and television shows, and a book has been written about you, stories have been written about you, and all kinds of crazy newspapers. I mean, yeah. you want to give up all this fame now? Uh, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> oh, I don't know. It, it, it's not, it does mean that much to me, fame. We should really set up an experiment it. sometime, Ed. We'll, we'll uh, set it up with Ted for you, and uh, you can pick some targets, and we'll try to do some things. Uh, well, see, I did right. not know Ted mm -hmm. Sirius was going to be here tonight, or I would have had a Polaroid camera here with fresh film. Well, we ought to, we ought to do it right some night and just come with 
tons of film and let Ted do his stuff. Yeah. And we'll snap it. Have you ever done it? Of course, I'd like to have a little uh, help, you know. A little peppermint schnapps? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you got to be a little snocker to take pictures? Oh, yeah, that helps. You're that helps. kidding. I'm not kidding. Altered I'm not states kidding. of consciousness, yeah. that is. Uh, <laughs> very, research it'd be very funny if, if you had a couple of shots and then we took the uh, Polaroid out <laughs> and your mind photographed a picture of Jim Beam, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how, I wouldn't mind that. Now, how... I'm just curious now. How much, how much alcohol would you have to have to have your mind in the proper state? I mean, do you have to be intoxicated or just a little happy? No, I don't want to be. No, uh, if I get drunk, then it it doesn't work. Doesn't work. No, if I get drunk, if I'm a little high, then it's fine. If I go go overboard, it's no good. Richard, have you seen his work? Yes, Ted has uh, produced a number of pictures for me. Uh, he's produced pictures uh, at Resurrection Cemetery for one place where he was able to produce. All kinds of strings of neon-like psychic lights. Now, this is the sort of uh, uh, these strings of light, uh, like uh, psychic streaks of light, it comes up at certain haunted spots from time to time. But I've never seen anything as intense as on some of the shots that Ted took. That Ted was responsible. For. Do you have to use a flash attachment, or do you look just no? Right I don't need no. I don't need anything. Got a question? Could you do this in a dark room as well oh, as a yeah, lighted room? Oh yeah, sure. Sure. Well, the cemetery was dark. <laughs> this is amazing. All right. If you'd like to ask any questions at all of Ted, he's here now and part of the program, and we'll continue right along. We have a gentleman on here. Mike, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Now, do you believe a guy like Ted can, in a dark room, no lights, no flash attachment, take a fully loaded Polaroid camera, point the lens at his face, and take a picture? I think I've seen some of his work in a, a, a magazine I read a couple years ago. Huh. And uh, from what I've read, it seems to be true. Well, I've read it, too. But again, I'm from Missouri. You'd have to show me. Where can I get a Polaroid camera at 1.30 in the morning? Uh, I don't have one. <laughs> Is there any listener who lives nearby our WIND studios with a Polaroid camera with fresh film and a bottle of schnapps? <laughs> Give us a call, and we'll bring you down here. How's that? That's right, because the strongest thing i got around here is tea. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Mike, what did you want to tell, uh, tell uh, us? Yeah. Morning? Um, I've heard you and Richard before on the radio, mm -hmm. and uh, I've got my family listening and people on the block because we only live two blocks away from Holy Cross Cemetery oh. in Cal City. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I haven't seen anything here, but I've heard Richard mention it before, and I was just wondering if he would relate the story once more. Okay, Holy Cross Cemetery, which of course is where Gene Krupa is buried also. Uh, apparently there was some kind of a hitchhiking ghost story some years ago involving a young girl and i had spent some time in the area trying to come up with more information on it and have to admit that so far it's been a i've had a complete uh failure coming up with any more information so uh perhaps someone out there with a bit of memory because it probably goes back a few years at least to the uh, early 50s or so uh, -huh. uh but if anyone out there could fill me in with more information on that i certainly would like to hear about it but apparently there was tradition in the area that there was a hitchhiking ghost or some kind of an incident with a female ghost out there at uh, Holy Cross Cemetery. Okay, well, if I ever hear anything, I'll be sure to get in touch with you because I've got your address. Okay. So I'll keep the listen for you. Appreciate it very much. Okay, fascinating show, Eddie. Thank it, you. Isn't it? Thank you very much for your call. 591-5656, WIND Chicago is uh, the station. Richard Crow is here. Ted Sirios is here. And hello there. Good morning. Hi there. Who's it, John? Yes. Hi, yes. John. You're on the radio. Okay. Uh, good morning to both of you. Thank you. And, uh, Ed, I have to say, you have a great show. Thank you, sir. And every time Mr. Crow is on, I have to get up my nightlights. <laughs> <laughs> and, unfortunately, I just lost my electricity five minutes ago. Are you Are you in a power failure? Yes. Where are you? Uh, Burr Ridge. Uh, you have any idea how extensive it is? Uh, I noticed the whole neighborhood is out, so... Really? I'll tell you, we'll call the Burr Ridge Police Department right now and see if we can find out what the problem is with your power outage, okay? Okay, it sends oh. send some chills up my spine, I'll uh, tell you. Woo. And I unfortunately, you. I'm in the dark with listening to you, but uh -huh. I still have some questions. All righty. Uh, I was wondering, Mr. Crow, yes. if on your tour you have ever experienced any uh, supernatural things. Okay, well... The whole gamut of supernatural happenings encompass much more than just visual sightings. Uh -huh. Although most people, of course, want to see a ghost, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, on the tours in the past, people have uh, photographed uh, things, picked up things on photographs, uh, uh, anomalous streaks of light, blurry, uh, blurred images, and things like this. But actual uh, sensations themselves have been limited to 
a set of roses uh, at the grave of a girl named Mary Alice Quinn, the Chicago Miracle Child, mm -hmm. as she was called, who was buried at Holy Sepulchre Cemetery on 111th Street uh, at Ridgeland Avenue uh, on the southwest side there. And at the location of her grave, many people, and myself included, have smelled a scent of roses. And there are no roses out there, no physical roses. Uh, this scent... Uh, seems to come on instantaneously and go away just as it came on mm. and uh, this is this has been the uh, uh, not only a recurrent thing but it is probably the most psychic thing that ever occurred on a tour uh, it's my own personal opinion backed up from the research I've collected that you cannot see a ghost or spirit during the daytime hours during uh, in direct sunlight let's put it that way mm -hmm. so of course it would be hard to see anything on the tour it'd be virtually impossible to see anything unless the weather conditions were right. And yet, uh, this scent of roses has cropped up again and again and again. Uh, not every tour, of course, but from time to time it does happen. And when it has happened, it usually happened to uh, about one-third of the bus, so maybe 15, 16 people uh, would experience this, which certainly is more than just a, a few people, perhaps, with more active imaginations or uh, mm. uh, a few people who are more suggestible than others. Mm, certainly is. Yes. Hmm. I was wondering also if uh, have been there been any like substantial reasons behind uh, ghosts themselves? Like, have been have they been violent deaths or uh, well, kind of common ground? When, when we talk about the rationale behind ghosts, there are probably as many reasons for ghosts as there are for any aspect of human activity. Uh -huh. uh, okay. There are different reasons for different ghosts, and there or appear to be different reasons for different ghosts. Uh, and yet, uh, some of the common factors that I've noted is that uh, mm. there is a religious connection uh, in many of these cases, or an anti-religious, if you will, mm -hmm. but let's say a strong philosophical belief uh, uh, in many of the cases. Uh, an early death is also uh, uh, crops up in, in many of these people who die at an early age. Uh, a very abrupt death is also a point that has been brought up, or someone dying perhaps not in the uh, right, uh, uh, right circumstance or right frame of mind. Let's say someone who died in a high fever, someone who died abruptly, head injuries very often, uh, spinal cord injuries, a death of this sort. And for some reason, uh, many, many more cases, I would say uh, statistically more female than male. Mm -hmm. So more women are involved than uh, males. I was wondering if uh, outside of Chicago, if you could get into the story of a uh a friend of mine is a trucker, and he goes down south once a bit, and there's supposed to be a t uh, courthouse down there. I don't know if you're involved. The one uh, down in uh, Alabama with the face in the window? Yeah, yeah, that's it. All right, I'll tell you what. We'll take a break for a message, and we'll tell the Alabama courthouse story, okay? Okay. All right, appreciate your call. Okay. And we'll check on Burr Ridge and the power for you. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It's unusual that that happened this morning, One thirty-five. W-I-N-D, Ted Surios is here, Richard Crow is here. We'll take a break for just a moment. Parents here this morning that I thought you'd be interested in. Are you superstitious, Mr. Ghost Hunter? Not really. Listen to this Knock one. Knock on wood. <laughs> Residents of Lakewood, Colorado have a right to be superstitious, perhaps. It seems a black cat has been terrorizing a residential area of Lakewood, Colorado. The cat has been sneaking into homes at night and attacking humans and also other cats, while eluding efforts to be caught itself. In the words of a Lakewood resident, I was awakened at one in the morning three times with a cat fight out on my bed. <laughs> I've had to take my cat to the vet three times. It's already cost me a bunch, and I'm just fed up with it. Animal Control Officer Don Wendt says wardens have searched the neighborhood for this black cat. They've set out traps. The cat sits on top of the traps, but it won't go in. And uh, one neighbor said she was attacked by the cat. The other day, she had to chase it out of her bedroom with a broom and went to the hospital for first aid. You ever heard of a cat that goes loony like that? No. I think maybe that cat is really not a cat, but uh, a human being trying to send a little message to other human beings. I wonder how it gets in. Doesn't say, but it's uh, gotten into dozens of houses in Lakewood, Colorado, and very often is found sitting at the end of a human's bed before it makes its move. Ooh. Sydney, Australia. Have you ever been to Sydney, Australia? Never been to Australia. Here's one from Sydney. Here's a report from the Yowie Research Center. You know what a Yowie is? You ever heard of the Yowie? No. Are you ready? An Australian naturalist claims that huge, hairy ape-like creatures are roaming dense bushland near the city of Sydney, Australia. Researcher Rex Gilroy says he's convinced Australia has a Yowie, 
a creature similar to the American Bigfoot and the Himalayan Abominable Snowman. He has called it the Yowie. He says he's checked out more than 3,000 reported sightings of the beast over the past 20 years and has now opened an office to do Yowie research. How do you like that? Mr. Gilroy claims there are between 400 and 600 Yowies. They are, he figures, about 10 feet tall and weigh around 400 pounds. I guess that's like Wally Chambers. <laughs> According to Gilroy, Yowies have been sighted by farmers and motorists and truck drivers and bushwalkers and train engineers, even police officers in remote areas of the Australian bush. Gilroy claims to have seen one of the Yowies himself. He says back in 1970, he is now planning a Yowie expedition to the interior to check out more recent sightings. Why not, right? If we have Bigfoot in Australia, have a Yowie. I wonder if I could ever get a hold of him and interview him about the Yowie. What do you think? Sounds good. All right. Have you ever heard about... We, we've had monster stories like this in the Chicago area, haven't we? Do you, do you remember the story a couple of years ago when there were those who were claiming that there was a Bigfoot in Carroll Carol Stream? Carol That's Stream. Right. What do you know about that? Because I'll tell you what I know about that, too. This was, this was a report of a Big, Bigfoot monster in Carroll Stream, Illinois, which is one of our suburbs. What do you know about that? I was out there, Ed, and spent some time out there in the woods at night. Uh, we did find some old footprints which may have been left by something like that mm -hmm. uh, they were uh, quite weathered by the time we got to them but there was something uh, uh, that had walked along the river uh, the, the stream bank down there I guess it was the, the Carroll stream too I suppose uh, but that area uh, would certainly uh, have been the sort of place you'd find a creature like this there were plenty of cornfields around there there'd be plenty of areas for natural forage and mm -hmm. if there was anything down there uh, certainly would have plenty to eat and uh, be able to travel the stream uh, stream banks down that way uh, pretty much undetected. I had a police officer call me, a canine officer. He refused to say what government agency he worked for, other than he was a sworn police officer, canine officer with a dog. He told me he was ordered to go with his dog into a sewer system underneath Carroll Stream to look for this thing. And he insisted, I, I grilled this guy for quite a while. He insisted that he and his dog partner went into several sewer openings in Carroll Stream to sniff around, walk the sewers, and find out if they could find any evidence of a Bigfoot in that town. He would not tell me what the results were. But uh, does that surprise you? Not at all. Uh, and there are also reports, Eddie, we might get some calls tonight, either from Carroll Stream, but also uh, uh, the reports around Saganeski Slough of such a creature. Really? The Saganeski Slough monster. Wait a minute, the Saganeski <laughs> Slough monster? Saganeski Slough, for any Saganeski Slough uh, uh, fanatics out there on the southwest side, uh, we'd appreciate some calls if you know anything of a uh, uh, creature reported out that way. I talked to uh, one girl who was out driving around in a four-wheel vehicle, mm -hmm. and uh, suddenly uh, some big uh, uh, hairy thing, some big dark thing jumped up and just ripped really? the mirror off the... Uh, off the side of the uh, uh, four-wheel vehicle, it had been stopped. It hadn't struck anything. Mm -hmm. This thing came out of the high high weeds and grabbed that, yanked it off, and then kept going, Ooh. and ripped off the uh, the three uh, brace bracket which holds the uh, mirror on the side of the four-wheel vehicle. Big and hairy. May, may have been an FM disc jockey on a trip, huh? That is amazing. Our number is five nine one five six five six. I wonder if Roland Eisenbeis of the Forest Preserve District of Cook County knows about the Saganaski Saganaski Slough Monster. You really heard the story, huh? Yeah, I've uh, well, I've, I've heard a lot, Ed, uh, as know. you may well guess. But mm. that uh, these people were firmly convinced that there was something uh, going on out there. Five nine one five six five six. Richard Crow's here. Hello, Debbie. Hello. Nice and loud. Now go ahead. Okay, I'm glad you plugged in for a few minutes beforehand because I was just starting to fall asleep with the phone in my ear. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> um, as the talks went on, I jotted things down it just reminded me of a few things for instance the woman that was talking about the case in brighton park about the boy taking the girl to the prom right there was a record out a long time ago called strange things happen in this world Lori. it wasn't well, that was, long ago right. there, were, wait a minute, there were two songs one mm -hmm. was called Lori. that was by dickie lee right and one was called Lori, and the other one was called patches Patches. That okay. also was by Dickie Lee. Strange things happened. I was thinking the one of Lori. Lori is It was about a boy that had taken a girl to a prom too, and she had asked him for her sweater, for his sweater, and he had taken her home the next day. He went back to the house and asked for the sweater, and the parents said, "How could you come back? She's been dead for over a year, you know." And some force drew him to the graveyard, and he found the sweater on her grave, or something like that. Yep. That. 
that kind of reminded me of the story that the woman was talking about from Brighton Park. And um, could be. I mean, it's you know, it was a very popular song, so many copies. Know. But that's ten, fifteen years ago already. Well, I don't know. I was only <clears> about, um, I'd say maybe ten or twelve years ago. My <clears throat> girlfriend's sister he had been talking about it then so mm -hmm. i was right uh very often there's a trinket or something left behind uh there's uh, a story in indiana and i can't think of the town itself although the uh, the hospital it, it was actually a girl going to a hospital and uh then they'd find in the car a scarf the hospital was a little company of mary the same name of uh, as one of our hospitals i can't think of the name of the uh, town in indiana i was just going through some uh, files the other day and found that again. Uh, so there often is some sort of a uh, uh, scarf or sweater or something left behind uh, as a, a sort of like a physical token that something did happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, okay, I had, my mom had an experience not too long ago. Um, she bought a house in Alsip. I live in Alsip also. Mm -hmm. And the house was built in 68. I would say in about 1970 or 71, she had gone to bed one night, and she heard this, um, this sound like heavy breathing, and she couldn't figure out what it was. She went, she thought maybe somebody was outside the door, the window in the bedroom trying to get into the house, or she really didn't know. So she went to the window, she listened, she didn't hear anything, she went back to bed, and it continued, and it got louder and louder. So then she thought one of us kids, he had, he had trouble breathing. She went into each of our bedrooms, she listened in each room, nothing happened. She went back to bed, and it was just, it seemed like in her room, okay? She went back again by the window. She didn't hear anything, and then she was determined to find out what had happened. She went into each of our rooms, and she sat down by each of us for, like, maybe two or three minutes, and it turned out that it was none of us. She went back to bed, and apparently it had just stopped on its own. She never did find out what it was. And a few months later, she ran into a friend who was into studying these kind of things, phenomenons that happen. And this woman had told her that apparently there was a spirit in the house, in her room, and what she should have done was stood in the middle of the room and demand that it leave. Wow, I've never heard of that, Rich. And this really, this, this give, even gives me the chills right now just to even talk about it because I don't know what it could have been she had no explanation at all it was just in her room do you mm. demand that a spirit get out uh, oh yes that's what this woman had told her that she should have done and she said if that door had opened and shut she would have had a heart attack right there you know if her bedroom door opened and shut as if somebody was leaving she wouldn't have known what she would have done if some human walked in your house said you'd tell him to get the heck out yeah 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 but a ghost well this is something she couldn't explain all she could hear was the breathing if that's what it was she couldn't see anything, and once she walked outside the room, she didn't hear it anymore. Hmm. I'm a little, uh, I'm a little shocked by that. So but it, it did, it did not come back though. Did no, it? but I believe it was the same week. Um, she was in the bathroom taking a bath, and well, when she heard this breathing right away, I'm sorry, no, this is the next thing. The the same week, she was in the bathroom taking a bath. My father was at work. And she heard the front door open and shut, and she, you know, thought it was my father coming in. Um, again, it was later at night, and we were in bed. And she came out of the bathroom thinking that it was my dad. She's looking around. She didn't, she didn't see him. She thought, well, he must be hiding on me, trying to play a trick. She smelled the aftershave, and like I said, she thought she heard the door. And she thought, okay, come on out, come on out, you know, nobody. He was not home. He wasn't home. So she, then she started thinking, well, what's going on here? She heard the door. The doors were locked. She smelled the aftershave. She didn't know. She really didn't know what had happened. Then she started thinking, well, sometimes they say you'll hear things or you'll smell things or like a sixth sense, you know, that something has happened chill to somebody. In chill, chill in the air or something? And, yeah. No, there was no chill in the air. It was just that she had heard the doors. Mm -hmm. And she did smell the aftershave. It was the same thing my dad wore. And there was nobody in the house. And it was like within a week time span, the same breathing and everything else. Since then, that I know of, she hasn't had anything. All right, that's amazing. I'm going to run along here because there are others waiting. But uh, it seems like to me, every time we do this, we get calls like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Um, I just wanted to say that I didn't realize that you were going to be on tonight. My fiance is a policeman out in the Payless area, and when uh-huh. I go to bed, I'm sure he'll fill me in on whatever else is being said. <laughs> That's but a real good area for things, too. I, yeah, he's... What department does he work for? Payless Park. Payless Park, Payless all right. Park. Has he, get, has he got me out to the uh, Wayside Marriage Chapel out there yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? yeah? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I said Marriage Chapel. He's only your fiancé. Right. Well, he's he works out by the Wayside Chapel. Uh-huh. That, uh, I think that is in Payless Park. Yes, it is. Are you, are you uh, going to get married soon? Three weeks. You're kidding. Three weeks, yeah. Yeah, good. congratulations. What's his name? Mike. Is he listening right now? He probably is. He told me he was going to be on, uh-huh. and that's why I've held on for two hours. I've always I wanted knew to... he wouldn't believe me if I had gotten through and he didn't hear it. Well, if he's listening right now, there's always something I wanted to say to a cop who might be listening in this patrol car. Can I say it to him? Go ahead. <laughs> All right, Mike, pull over. <laughs> I always wanted to say that. Thank okay, you for now your call. I just wanted to say something about monks. You had said something about monks, and I was just wondering if Mr. Crow has heard anything about Monk's Castle which is located on or about 107th. 107th and Archer. Right. Mm-hmm. I had been up there a few years ago, and um, he had come in contact with a few, not um, in the scary sense. I had gone up to the house, and I had talked to one of them, and it was really creepy, but I have heard about Peabody's tomb. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, because there's a whole lot of baloney associated with the, the story of Peabody's tomb. But um, what, what some people do is, uh, for some reason, Eddie, uh, people have mistaken uh, uh, St. James Sag Church and Cemetery, known as Monk's Castle, and some people claim that Peabody's buried out there, which is completely erroneous. We will, ex- we will explain that, too. My dear, I'm going to run. You keep the radio on, okay? Okay. Thank you. You're Bye-bye. Welcome. Bye-bye. It's 154 WIND, the Alabama courthouse. You heard about that. Uh, it's Carrollton, Alabama, I believe, and in the courthouse, in the top window, there is a face in the window, and it's almost sort of like one of the smiley faces of a couple of years ago. But it's a, uh, a white image with the eyes and the mouth uh, very distinct, and this appeared on the window, and supposedly dates the time when uh, I believe an individual was lynched uh, for a crime which he did not commit. What apparently came out later he did not commit. And uh, this is sort of a sign of innocence, which would be very interesting because of these impressions on walls or on windows and so on. There's a famous handprint in the, uh, I think it's Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, in the wall of the jail cell, where one of the Molly Maguires, uh, the uh, Irish miners group uh, uh, where one of these uh, individuals was taken out and executed from this jail cell and he said it's a sign of my innocence put his hand against the wall and he said that mark will remain there from then on and sure enough they still point out that handprint on the jail cell wall are in you Pennsylvania familiar, are you familiar with the story that there is either a face image or a handprint on the window of a Chicago firehouse the window unfortunately was broken by a paper boy but there are plenty of firemen around who can tell you that story about the fireman. In fact, I had that fireman's grandson on my tour two years ago. Really? Whose uh, grandfather was the uh, person who left that ghostly handprint on the uh, uh, pane of glass in the firehouse. Do you remember what the story was as to how it got there? He was washing windows, the fire alarm came, and he went to answer to the call and was killed in that fire. And they found his handprint forever embedded on the window. The remaining uh, men coming back from that fire found a handprint on the glass. Uh, of the window that he was washing before that. And it was just etched in there and couldn't be scraped off or wash off or anything else. It was there for many years, and uh, many firemen around Chicago had seen that firehouse, which is now closed, had seen that particular window, had seen that handprint. And the window was broken by the newsboy, huh? Uh, That's the story I've heard. It was broken by a a newsboy with a bad left hook. Uh, we'll, we'll be back in just a moment. Richard Crow is with me from WIND Radio. Jennifer. Schwartz Ted Sirius is here also. Rich, let's go back on the telephone. Hello there. Hi, good morning, Ed. Uh, who's this? Uh, my name is Wayne. Hi, yeah. Wayne. How are you? Uh, pretty good. How are you doing? Okay. Mike? Oops, wait a minute, Wayne, before you go ahead. This just came in. Okay, I'm sitting here with a, an old friend of uh, Rich's. Uh-huh. If he remembers Maggie, the Irish dancer. Maggie, the Irish dancer. Boy, this could be a very embarrassing story, Rich. I don't know if we should tell this. <laughs> well, we've been listening to the show since you, since you came on, and we have a Polaroid camera at your disposal with a roll and a half of film, which you can have in 20 minutes. In 20 minutes? But, we, but you see, Ted says that in order to perform, his mind has to be a little bit li- unlimbered with a, a little bit of the spirit. 
Well, and we, we don't have it. any spirits here at WIND, and frankly, I don't know if it's allowed even. I would have to ask uh, one of our program department executives. I would have to wake somebody up and find out whether or not they would allow alcoholic beverage in the studio. The only other time that's ever been allowed was when Dave Baum got drunk on the air one night uh, with the Chicago Police Department to prove how easy it was to get drunk and not even realize it and then go out and drive a car. Oh. So they brought a breathalyzer in and Dave got plastered on screwdrivers over the period of about three or four hours. And when he was all through, we poured him into a cab and sent him home. That's the only time I've ever seen alcohol allowed in the studio, so I'll have to check on that. There's no way you can do it without being a little bit... Uh... Uh, Ted says he's got to be a little bit uh, schnockered, right? Is that correct, Ted? Yeah, it works better. That it way. works better. <laughs> 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 that way, if Ted's photographs doesn't don't come out, he doesn't care. <laughs> let me uh, let me let me have one of our producers call and find out if we can get permission. Okay. Okay. Because uh, I will not break the rules if if that can't be done, then I won't do it here. Okay? Either that, or we can meet him downstairs and take him out to the corner and come back. <laughs> Great. Who's going to drag him back upstairs? <laughs> Yeah, we could do that. We could send Ted downstairs and let him get snuckered in the alley. <laughs> that's got my, I mean, I'm, that'd be thoroughly amazing to see that done. I'm really... Yes, yeah, so well, that would be thoroughly amazing to me, too. Tell you what, you listen, and if we can do that, I tell you, we'll get your number off the air, and we'll call you back. How's that? Okay. Ted, uh, when you take great pictures, when you take uh, good pictures, what do you get snuckered on? What do you use? Oh, anything. I don't, I don't care. Lighter fluid? <laughs> no, 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 no. Sterno? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe this. All right, I'll tell you what. You you hold on a second here, Wayne, and we'll get your name and address, or your name and phone number off the end. We'll call you if we can do it, okay? Okay. All right, hold on one second. We'll, uh, we'll find out exactly what's happening. This is WIND Chicago, first on your dial. Ed Schwartz, hello. Yeah, hi. Who's this? This is Denise. Good morning, Denise. <laughs> How are you, dear? You're on the radio now. Oh, good. Okay. Okay, I have a question to ask. There was a woman that called previously, and she was mentioning something about Peabody's tomb. Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, we were going to explain that, yes. Right, huh? because I remember as a teenager, friends of mine talking about that and also Bachelor's Grove, you mm. know, like combined as being like a typical hangout let's go look for fun i know pea but the name peabody is very important to the state of illinois because this, this is the same peabody from the famous peabody coal, peabody coal, coal mines company. right and uh, they have been uh, obviously leaders in coal production in this state for years now there is a story that i first heard from rich and and one thing before he tells us let me do one thing sure. let me say that when we talk about locations uh, many of them are private property you are never ever Right. encouraged to violate the private property rights of others. Right. And if you do and you get arrested, then you deserve it. You only go to a cemetery during the hours that it's open. You never go to a forest preserve after hours. You never go anywhere when it's after hours because you deserve whatever happens to you. We have never, ever encouraged anybody to go anywhere outside of uh, normal visiting hours or without an invitation. Now, the story of Peabody's tomb is very interesting. We've been telling this for years, but we've had to debunk part of that story, haven't we? Yes, uh, it's unfortunate, Ed, that some people run away with aspects of a story and just elaborate upon the legend and come up with a completely different story when it's over with. Mm -hmm. uh, the original Peabody's tomb, the original Peabody mansion, for that fact, uh, still exists. It's on 31st Street, just west of Route 83, in the western suburbs. The Peabody Mansion is now owned by the Franciscan Fathers, and it is used for a retreat house. It's called Mays Lake, Mays Lake Retreat House. Now, Peabody was originally buried on the property in the uh, in a little chapel, which is still in existence out there, but which has b had to be moved, actually, from its original location because of all the people who were going out there at night looking for it. So the chapel was moved, and it's now protected with... Uh, lights and so on so by no means go out there because you're just asking and you will get trouble if you go out there trespassing on the property but historically peabody was a very interesting character the peabody coal company was um his creation he made quite a bit of money with that it was a very wealthy man he was buried on his property and uh, a character like this like peabody who was very paranoid incidentally who when he built his mansion had secret tunnels and passageways in the house and everything else uh, and the house was built with the, the Tudor-style beams and everything, like an English manor house. A very interesting place. Peabody would be the kind of a person you would expect to have legends grow up about him, but the legends grew up in a very strange way. The story began to circulate that Peabody was buried in the crypt, not in the ground, but kept in a vat of formaldehyde. That his yeah. body was kept in a glass tank, and that if you came out there at night, 
or came out there and went into the place, went into the crypt, you could find him floating around there in his vat. Well, there is a body in a glass case owned by the Franciscans, and it is in the seminary building, St. Joseph Seminary, to the western edge of the property. And this is apparently where the switch came in. There is actually the relics of a little boy, the bones of a little boy found in the catacombs. And this boy dates to the early Christian era. His name was St. Innocent. He must have been about six or seven years old. Just a small little boy. His bones are reconstructed and put in a wax body, dressed in period clothing of Roman times. And that wax body with the clothing was put in a glass case, and it's now revered uh, at the base of an altar, a side altar of the chapel at St. Joseph Seminary. So there actually is a body in a glass case out there. Uh, it does date back to Roman times. It, it is uh, a sacred object. It is the relics, the bones of a young boy who died a, a martyr's death. So there is a body out there. And somehow, in the retelling of the stories, uh, some people got a little bit carried away, I'd say, a, a lot carried away. And the story of the body uh, came up that uh, it was Peabody's body, and it was kept in the chapel building, uh, the small chapel building near the retreat house. But it's actually kept in the chapel of the main floor of the seminary building on the western edge of the property away from the uh, Peabody original Peabody mansion mm -hmm. and uh, it is uh, kept there and uh, if you go there for mass sometime on a Sunday morning you can see it it's still there to this day so that's how the story got started uh, apparently it was a, a, a case of mistaken identity of uh, whose body was where because I remember a lot of my friends talking about going out there and seeing it themselves, and you know, well, like you say, having stories turned around, you know, that it was Peabody himself in there. And, um, you know, between, you know, I don't know, his, sometimes, you know, how, like you say, people get carried away with their own legends and stuff, you know, mm -hmm. with a legend. And well, the, the priests down there are very upset. They don't want people violating their property rights. They right. will prosecute you if you go on private property. Right, we're, we're not telling the story to get everyone to go out there, obviously. Oh, no, no, we're no, trying no, to, to clarify the real historical basis of. Uh, of who Peabody was and uh, uh, who, in this case, the uh, the relics are, the relics of a little boy, St. Innocent. And it is a very uh, uh, remarkable thing to see. The poor Clara nuns used to do this a lot, Ed. They would get skeletons from the catacombs in Rome with papal permission, take these skeletons of various saints, primarily Christian martyrs, and put them together in wax bodies, uh, almost uh, a very uh, high state of... Uh, uh, like a wax museum art almost, mm -hmm. putting together a wax head and, and putting the hairs in the head and so on. And very remarkable and beautiful work. And uh, there are other examples of this around the United States and around the world, actually. The Poor Clares had made uh, uh, sort of a, a, a business, if you will, of this. The Poor Clare nuns uh, previously, up until recent years, were cloistered order, which meant that they would take no, the... Uh, outdoors, yeah. They would, they would uh, uh, just go away somewhere into... Uh, 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 their little convent area. Never, only certain members of the group would be able to speak to outsiders. The rest of them would take the, uh, would take an oath of silence, would not speak, and so on. And they did quite a bit of embroidery work, working on uh, uh, vestments and uh, linen and so on for church services. And also, they did this remarkable work with the skeletons, with the uh, various martyrs. Oh, uh, so that's how it all got started. That's how it got started. Because I remember, like I said, this has been many years back, though, that friends of mine talked about things like this. And, like, I remember one time even going out to Bachelor's Grove myself, it was during the day. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking at the tombstones, how they were defaced with spray paint, graffiti all over them. And I remember standing there, what did people get, you know, get a kick out of doing that for? You know, because here it's a place to, you know, you wonder, gee, what has happened here? But, you know, it's how they have defaced them also. It's really a shame because uh, I, I, of course, have had the privilege to travel in England and Ireland, Scotland. And you don't see this at all. You don't see the desecration mm -hmm. uh, in a graveyard uh, in Europe. You know, it's uh, it might be uh, moldy and grown over with moss and uh, falling but over from age, but there's no but there's no vandalism. There, there's no deliberate vandalism, and it's something that you only find here, here in the United States. It's, it's most unfortunate. Right. I would also point out that courts do not treat kindly those arrested, those arrested for defacing tombstones or, uh, or any kind of uh, cemetery vandalism. They just don't appreciate it, neither does uh, anybody who's ever lost a loved one. So if you do that and get caught, you deserve whatever you get. 
Well, I've never done that. <laughs> well, I hope you won't, but we, we do have those who do. Thank you for your call. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Again, I'm glad, I'm glad you were able to clarify that all over again because it's very important that we... Uh, no, let you know that uh, private property lines are to be respected. We've we've talked about haunted locations here on the program and not been able to give out their uh, their addresses for the simple reason that people go where they don't belong, right? That's right. That's another reason why, uh, although there aren't a great number of haunted houses with people living in them around Chicago, if we were, of course, to mention a, a home, a private home that has had some. Uh, um, Adventures or misadventures, I'm, I'm afraid the poor people living there would be swamped with people. Exactly, and probably be very upset. Morning, W-I-N-D. Hi, Ed. Yes, sir. This Paul, is Paul. Paul Boy from Milwaukee. Hi, Paul. Uh, I've got a couple of interesting ghost stories that were sort of passed along through the family that I would like to relay. All right, I hope you'll uh, keep your remarks brief so that we can get others on as well. Right. Okay. Uh, the one is, uh, my grandmother relayed to me, is uh, her family had purchased a home and run into quite a few noises in the home in this month they lived there. They were about the third owner in a year's period. And they finally sold the home because of the noises. And the next party that bought the home had the same problem. They went through the home, discovered that there was a body who was somebody who committed suicide in the attic. They found the body itself? They found a person who had hung himself, a skeleton was there. And uh, they called a parish priest, and he came in and blessed the house and said that uh, the noises were caused by this uh, the ghost of this person wishing to be buried. I was wondering if this was something that, you know, was you heard of before. Is That's an amazing story. I've heard of uh, ghosts of suicides and so on in places, but I've never heard of a, a suicide who was never discovered until the... Uh, after strange happenings led to the discovery of a suicide right, bone. It, it was sort of in a back room in an attic type thing where they found the body. It was a rumor in the house. It was just missing, and they figured he'd moved out and not said anything. <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's a very interesting discovery to make, certainly a very uh, incredible one. Uh, when did that happen? Uh, this would have been in the early 1900s. Uh-huh. <laughs> you wonder that they never would have got a whiff of that. <laughs> yeah, you'd think so, wouldn't you? Mm. But I, I guess it was a big, you know, like a four-story house. Nobody ever thought... Uh, I'll go through the house completely, I guess. Stranger things have probably happened. Right. Mm -hmm. Another another one of the same thing is uh, one of our relatives, this goes back to about the same period, uh, had quite a few uh, children, and one child was born just before the mother died. And uh, the husband remarried, and uh, his new wife was not real interested in the children. There was a baby, like I say, that you know, was a couple months old at the time, or a year old, and the child was never taken outside. And... There were noises in the house, and what they found the noises to be was there was a baby buggy in the attic, which was moving back and forth across the attic floor. And after they took the baby buggy out of the attic and uh, cleaned it up and started taking the child out, and, you know, out in the outdoors and stuff, the noises had stopped. They could have cured that easy by putting on a set of rubber baby buggy bumpers. Oh, bad, Eddie, bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, you got some good stories there. Well, they were, those, those were stories like, well, I'm sure almost every family's got them to get passed along. And Stay out of the attic. <laughs> <laughs> or you might find bats in the belfry. Right. Thanks for your call. Okay. Take Thank care. You. 233, have you discovered any new ghost stories in the area that you haven't told me since your last visit, sir? Oh, actually, Eddie, the one I've been working on, and I'll be back in Indiana shortly, is the famous Francisville Ghost Light. Tell me about the Francisville Ghost Light. I was out there uh, two weeks ago, well, a week before last. It'll be two weeks this weekend. It's a very famous ghost light, and probably the closest, uh, let's say, recurring, uh, well, I'm trying to, let's say, it's the closest light to Chicago ghost light that does recur on a, on a somewhat regular basis. This particular light is believed to... Uh, come from a, to stem from a auto accident that occurred about 30 years ago. And it comes down this one stretch of road uh, in this one area uh, near Francisville, Indiana. Now, Francisville is east of Rensselaer, where St. Joe's College is. So maybe we have some St. Joe people listening tonight who might have seen this. But the particular light is a red light, which comes down the road, and it's believed to uh, have started after an auto accident, which uh, involved the uh, demise of some three or so individuals. And I was out there a uh, weekend before last with uh, uh, 
A mutual friend of ours, Bob, the Cook County policeman, who's probably listening tonight as well. Hi, Bobby. And Bob and I were out there, and unfortunately, we didn't see anything that night. But we do uh, have quite a bit of testimony from people who have seen this thing on a number of occasions, and it apparently is almost there nightly. And I was a bit disappointed I didn't see it, but I'm not going to give up on it that easy. I will be going back out there again shortly. I have uh, have some letters out to the Rensselaer Republican and some of the local papers down there. So hoping to gather much more material on that. But it is a regular feature of life down there. and In fact, so much so that nobody pays much attention to it in town. You ask them where the light is. Oh, yeah, it's down that road. And veer around. And <clears throat> they never even bother with it. It's funny how you can get so used to your local phenomena that it doesn't even phase you at all. So that's the one I've been working on now. And that, of course, is a... Uh, uh, one of the stops I want to have on my Indiana tour, which I've been working on. The Indiana tour, Eddie, which I'm trying to finish up on now so I can offer it before Halloween, uh, will include uh, things like a stop to the Spiritualist Museum in Chesterfield, Indiana, where they have pictures painted by spirits oh. and ectoplasm and display and ghostly photographs and so on. And... Uh, some good things like that we're going to have in the Indiana tour. The Indiana tour will be an overnighter. We're going to get you on that one of these. Oh, places. an overnighter! As soon as I get that going, it'll be the my first overnight Ooh. ghost tour. Do you have an, uh, a haunted motel to stay in? Well, we're we're probably going to wind up staying in Francisville after we see this ghost light. It'll probably Ooh. be late by the time we see that. Oh, a haunted motel in Francisville. I think that's very exciting. I'm all for that. I will right, we'll stop for just a moment. Richard Crow is with me. Then we'll come back. On WIND Radio, I have 20, oh, let's see here, about 23 minutes ahead of 3 o'clock in the morning. It's Friday, and if you're planning some weekend activity, you're out uh, for uh, a little bit, a small cup of alcohol to uh, loosen up his mind. And then we're going to try some of his psychic photography. What we're going to do is then bring Ted back into the building with a Polaroid camera with a fresh roll of film. We're going to have him look at the lens of the Polaroid camera and see if he can produce images on film. Richard and I will be the witnesses, correct? That's right. All right, and we won't tell any fibs, will we? Not a bit. Not a bit. You'll oh. see it all live on the radio. That's right, or hear it, one or the other. Hello there. Ah, the phone's ringing around here. Good morning. Let me kill my radio here. All right, here's Bill. Don't don't kill it, just maim it a little bit. Okay. Okay, okay go ahead, Bill. Well, that's uh, kind of a long story. All right. But about, oh, about 100 years ago, my great-grandfather or my great-great-grandfather, whichever one it was, bought a piece of land down by Beecher, Illinois. And uh, up until we sold the land, which was about 20 years ago, about every two or three months, this blue light would come floating across the fields and hang out by this forest that was um, over to one side, dividing the two pieces of property between the next farm and ours. And uh, this would happen a couple times a year. And uh, I was just wondering what causes something like that. Well, a blue light means different things in different cultures. Uh, was this area inhabited before your your people got there? Uh, not that I know of. I don't think so. Uh huh. They might have been. Blue lights may uh, date back to Indian times. It may have something to do with an Indian spirit. But in Mexico and in South America, a light like that would mean buried treasure. And you mentioned that the light went to a particular spot all the time? Uh, well, like, there was a forest, a uh -huh. line of trees that you know, divided the two um, pieces of property. And it seemed to come out of there and just float around for a while and go back into there and disappear. Okay. And how often did that happen? It happened uh, about three or four times a year, I guess. Uh -huh. It may still be going on. Like I said, we sold the property some 20 years ago. Uh huh. And um, as far as I know, I guess it's still going on. I saw it twice. I was rather young when they sold the property, but I do remember seeing it. Uh huh. And um, I guess my father would be able to tell tell you more about it if you'd like me to drop, have him drop you the line. I appreciate it. How far downstate is that? Beecher, Illinois. Uh huh. It's uh. Oh, not too far. That's not. That's about an hour from here. It's right within our WIND uh, listening area. Oh, definitely. It's down Route 1. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. No That's, problem at all. You know, Eddie, one of the things that fascinated me in, in Ireland in particular were the, the ghost stories associated with buried treasure. And this blue light sort of thing, if it does point out a particular spot or an area, it may well be something hidden there. Well, I say buried treasure. It, 
possibly is not riches or something like that, but it could possibly be leading to uh, something from uh, lost from some time ago, perhaps even a grave or something, uh, something hidden there, something that uh, uh, perhaps uh, psychically we are having our attention drawn to. Hmm. And I certainly would be interested in hearing about that, and I wouldn't mind driving down there. Has the area changed much since uh, your family sold it? Uh, no, it's basically stayed just plain farms. Uh-huh. And um, I, I haven't been down there in years and years. Might be possible to check that out and go over there and look over the area. And I have never talked to the people who bought the farm from us. Uh-huh. But, um... <clears throat> Let us know. I could write you a letter and tell you how to get in contact with those people. That I would appreciate that very much, and I shall look into that. And if you'd like to... Uh